Um, well, yeah, look, I'll, I'll, you say something very briefly in, in, in that when we held a forum up at Hunter College, uh, uh, and this was on the principles and policies uh, for GIS in New York City, it was entitled The Future of GIS in New York City, we were all com just completely blown away by Amanda and your assistant commissioner talking about cycle media and about 3D and about all the things that you were doing or future looking new innovative stuff. We just and so we were determined to bring Amanda here. She's been working with the Department of Finance for the last X number of years, but previous to that at DOT and then census, I guess, and whatever. So we're we're extremely pleased to have you. Thank you for agreeing uh, to come and speak and the floor is yours, and supplement anything I said today. You're welcome. Uh, well, it's nice to see all of you, some familiar faces, some new ones. Um, I've been a member of Gizmo since I think it was 1992. I used to work here doing research uh, for a not-for-profit organization, and uh, at that time I had the pleasure to join and meet Jack, and I've been a member since. So it's, it's nice uh, to be here and just share with you what I've been doing uh, for the past uh, couple of years since I joined the Department of Finance. As Al said before, um, I've been in the GIS community for over 20 years um, in government. Um, prior to the finance, I worked for the New York City Department of Transportation. I also worked for the federal government for the Census Bureau. So, uh, well, Let's get started. Um, the agenda is as follows. I don't think I need to give you a GIS intro. I think you are pretty familiar with the subject. Uh, I'll talk about the tax map unit, our digital tax map, uh, our 3D work for air and subterranean lots, and then I will provide you a demo. I will also give you a quick overview of other GIS initiatives that we um, have at finance and some of the products that we have uh, developed. So the tax map unit. Um, the tax map unit is responsible for the tax map, which is um, a comprehensive inventory of all the parcels in the five boroughs. And the tax map, the purpose of it, aside from defining and delineating the land, is that it supports property valuation. When properties are assessed, the land is one of components in those calculations. Right? Right. <laughs> um, oh, am I going to be critical of this? I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I have a tough client here. Um, we're a small unit. We have uh, six uh, cartographers. Uh, one customer service manager, one customer service representative in our customer service center with, where we receive all the applications for subdivisions in the city of New York. We do mergers, apportionments, and condominiums, and condominium amendments, and condeterminations, and there are all these different nuances that uh, we do uh, with the tech, at the tax company. Unit. And I am the director of that unit. So I just want to give you a quick background in regards to the tax map. Prior to 2008, the tax map was managed by paper maps. It was Mylar and linen maps. I know, that was 10 years ago. Um, but the operations were conducted differently. Each borough had their own um, set of cartographers that would edit the, the tax map. Um, in 2008, there was a project to digitize all of those maps, and that's when we launched the digital tax map as it is stands right now. There are two applications. There is the application, GIS application, that is used by the cartographers on a day-to-day -day basis to edit the map. And in 2009, we launched the online version. And people call it, uh, you know, it's a web GIS, but people call it DTM online. 
and the, the public can access all of the uh, data. We can do searches by borough, by address, look at the history of the changes that have taken place, and uh, all sorts of registries. Uh, this application, I'll talk more about it uh, as we come up. So in this images, you know, it's sort of like a little glimpse of the evolution of the text map. And in the future, we want to have this 3D uh, component. So our current GIS, as I mentioned before, we have two applications. The one that we use for the day-to-day -day operations of the edits, and that is um, costume application.net that was built uh, by a vendor for us. Um, we call it the wizards because it has uh, a set of instructions to manipulate the edits that we perform. So it's kind of like closed off. There are instances that those uh, wizards are not as useful for certain uh, manipulations of the edits, so we then uh, open it up through the cartographers for uh, use of the additional tools that are part of the suite of the ESRI product. And then we have the public facing uh, web GIS. Initially it was built um, with the tools of the time, but then right now it's being managed by um, the Department of Information Technology, Do It. And it's an open source based uh, application and you can also access all the other uh, administrative boundary layers as well as uh, satellite imagery that is available uh, through Do It. So the map becomes a little bit more richer uh, for the public to use. Unfortunately, that uh, application you know, reached its end and it has been deprecated. So it has become very important for us to um, modernize our systems and take advantage of the latest technology that is available um, in regards of GIS. So 3D is the first thing we started to explore and this started two years ago because um, we have registered in the tax map air and subterranean lots. New York City, if you're familiar with the zoning, we have very strange uh, sort of arrangements, to put it lightly. Um, so some of our clients want to just register through the Land Records Division an actual lot, but it's composed of air or it's subterranean. Uh, there are various reasons why they do this, and I will um, go into detail as we move forward. So we wanted to look at that universe of those specific lots and try to see them and look at their distribution. Because right now, our map is 2D, so there's no way we can see how they're floating, if we know the upper limiting plane, above that base lot. Uh, we also want to explore integrating condominium uh, floor plans to be able to do the same because each unit in a condominium is considered a lot. So unfortunately we can't see them. We can see the listing of them when you go to our DTM online application, but it's just a designation with a letter C and the condominium number on a flat, you know, sort of surface. So we want to be able to extrude that and being able to manipulate all of those units and add additional characteristics for uh, modeling purposes. Um, we also need to create 3D lots. Basically, we have gotten requests that people just want to consider a lot, something floating above an actual uh, platform. So we actually got a request that the platform had, it was kind of like a spider encapsulating a, a existing building and every single pillar that touched the uh, ground was considered the land along with 
the platform. That is problematic for many reasons. Like, you know, the tenants below were not happy. And in addition to that, it, it, you know, we can't do it in our existing application. So technology is limiting us in that end. And at the same time, we need to generate new uh, property valuation models to consider a platform land. I know, it's, it gets complicated. <laughs> so, um, and lastly, you know, the whole reason is that if we can see things in 3D, we can do further uh, spatial analysis, such as line of sight. And this is an example that you know I always bring up. Basically, if we know the the um, condos, you know, upper limited plane, and all the the places where the uh, units are located, then you can you know add different factors such as you know sun shadow analysis type of uh, work. So. I consider us the first uh, in the U.S. who are working in an actual, through 3D cadastral uh, map. Uh, and we actually launch our 3D work just for subterranean and uh, air lots this past February. So, here I'll explain a little bit. This is a quick view of the distribution of those lots. It's 294, what we call 9,000 are the air, and the 8,000 are, there are only 67 of them. So what we did, it was, the technology was the easiest part in this project. It was going through all the property records, because you have to read deeds, look at all maps, and trying to decipher if the information in regards of the upper limiting plane was provided because our geo database doesn't have a provision to enter that information so we created a separate geo database that captured that information so what we did even though there are 294 air lots we only mapped those that we could find that upper limiting plane in uh, our property records because we didn't want to make assumptions about you know, what potential type of um, space or air was encompassed without really knowing. And we didn't want to base it on zoning because that's outside of our, our jurisdiction. So we didn't want to mislead uh, the public. So it was uh, basically, you know, in terms of the technology, what we did, we created a replica of the base lot and then used that and enter all the additional attributes and then extruded it. And we utilize our GIS Pro. If you're not using it, I suggest that you do because it's, um, it has improved greatly. I've been using it since like two years ago and from then to now, it's much better. And I have to say and give credit to us at DOF that S3 has been a really good partner and um, as a result of our work and what we wanted to do, they have um, added the functionality as that we needed to complete this project. So that was a very successful um, collaboration. So that being said, always push the vendors a little bit. <laughs> Okay, so what I did was just a pretty, uh, um, utilizing uh, the S3 products, I built myself this application. I mean, I think everybody can do this now with the technology. So what you see is, you know, I'll, I'll uh, navigate a little bit so you can see some of the plots. And this is a 3D scene that you can now create using uh, ArcGIS Pro and you can also 
uh, then share it through ArcGIS Online, or if you have ArcGIS for Portal, it's the same thing. Um, you can quickly navigate, and you can use a very good locator uh, from uh, DBG, uh, the developer is right here, Ed Farrell, please talk to him. Um, he's wonderful to work with, so I, I, I advise you to speak to him. Um, I'm going to type in borrow, block, block, block. And you're quickly taking it identifies it. What is wonderful about this locator is that it works in 3D. Um, in this particular example, I, if I would have had all the units, it would identify the specific unit in that condominium. So these are the top reasons why people want these uh, airlocks. They just want to uh, attach a mortgage to something tangible. So they seeking financing and they say, oh, I own this piece of air and then I can get a mortgage out. I know it's strange. Uh, they want to add square footage. That's the most common. They want to utilize the uh, additional development <coughs> rights that exist in that uh, zoning lot. Uh, they want to preserve the views. You know, everybody's blocking each other. Well, some are doing the opposite. They're just capitalizing on buying that piece of air so nobody can obstruct their views. And lastly, you know, investment purposes. They're very expensive and, you know, they just buy pieces and then stack them up in the skinny buildings that you see uh, these days. Okay, so let me go back. So I think I already gave you a quick demo of the um, Okay, so this is the technology that I used. Um, you know, RGIS Pro, RGIS for Server, RGIS for Portal, uh, the Locate uh, New York City by DBG, RGIS Online, and everything that my infrastructure, I built it in the cloud. So it's an AWS EC2. So this is a diagram of what I built uh, actually last year. It was a labor of love not building, and this is always the issue in city government, is procurement. It takes a long time to uh, procure anything. Um, so I hired ESRI, they came, they spent a week with me, we diagrammed everything out, and um, we got it up and running. And this is where all my um, 3D work uh, lives right now. So it's very stable. Uh, I'm the administrator, too, of this environment, and it has been very successful. So if you have any questions in regards of implementations of this nature, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to uh, talk to you about it. So four years ago, it's going to be five in October, um, I joined DOF. And when I joined, of course, I was not specifically hired for the tax map, I was hired for a different project that they also needed somebody with GIS skills. And I said, sure, I can take care of that. And then a year later, I was promoted. And so I now have two units. I have the original that I, I was hired for plus the tax map unit. And um, I was surprised that, you know, of course, I came from the DOT where I built our, you know, infrastructure to, and I couldn't believe they didn't have one. They were just running desktop uh, art map. Uh, and it was specifically the modeling team. And that's when I decided to take upon myself to preach GIS and start, you know, building things. So one of the first, we only have uh, one staff supporting our work uh, clients.
So since I've done the work before, I took possession of our ArcGIS online uh, account, so I'm the you know administrator of that, so we could start quickly pushing out products. So this one was the first, and basically we call it property maps. And it makes sense, you know, in this day and age, you want to search for your property and obtain all the different characteristics associated with it. So you can quickly go, and it's by tax class. And it explains once you go to the our portal, which is uh, right here, where those uh, property maps are. They're by borough, by tax class. And you can quickly launch one. And you can type uh, a BBL or block and block. And, well, you're in the borrow, so just a block a lot. And go there. And it just takes you to that particular location. You can get quick information about the property. And on the right hand side, obtain information that usually you have to navigate to this very not so interesting. Um, place that you just try to figure it out which is what is your BBL by doing a conversion of the address <coughs> and then you know obtain some of this so it's summarized in here we just added this get street view and that it takes a little bit to load but it's just a preview of the product that we're using which is Cyclomedia so now you can if it loads it shows you a picture of the property. It's not loading. So, oh, so there, there it is. is. Yeah. And you can actually navigate within that same. Uh, and those green dots are called cycloramas. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll I'll talk more about that. Then. Another tool, another product we uh, deploy is this one, and this is very neat. Uh, the developer is in our staff and basically gives you the comparable uh, properties. So you can type again your horrible <coughs> plot. Looks like I'll use the same. And you just hit find comps. It highlights them there, but you can also see a listing that you can download. And same again, you get just a quick overview of all the, prop the property data of those specific comparables. And it also allows you to view it, um, that snapshot. And Cyclomedia, which is like, has been revolutionizing you know, people in the US. I had the opportunity to meet with the GIO, Geographic Information Systems Officer of the City of Philadelphia. They were uh, one of the first ones who uh, did a, an implementation of Cyclomedia, and it was great. I mean, um, I'm a strong advocate for collaboration, and I think we always need to reach out. And um, it was great. We have been sharing our experiences, and um, now we have it since last year. So the current year capture is in progress. It's almost complete. It is a lot of data. The staff working with the LiDAR uh, cycle media data can tell you and there's a lot to do with this information. So basically, <coughs> um, our analytics group created a workflow to try to use this for property assessment desktop review. We're not uh, eliminating our assessor's work, field work. We're just complementing that and making it a little bit more targeted. So instead of them going blindly, we can quickly identify from the desktop if there was a demolition or if there was a new building and send the inspectors, uh, you know, the assessors there to capture any additional characteristics that might improve our models for valuation. So we take our camera data, which is 
uh, the computer assisted mass appraisal. We have over a million parcels. It would be an impossibility for us to do it without the CAMA system. Um, this is our repository of our um, appraisal data. Then we use GIS to generate several layers that then are imported into Cyclomedia. So the inspectors have a listing that they can page through and quickly go through all of those different uh, images of the properties that have been designated to them. So it was a listing of probably 800,000 uh, parcels, and these were distributed throughout the five boroughs for the assessors to. Amanda, could you, I can't read it. I'm sure uh -huh. people sitting in the back would have difficulty. These, Can you read off those data layers? Yes, uh, administrative areas, rights and interest, site addresses, ownership and tax parcels, parcel framework, and orthophotos. And oh, demo cyclo. But what is important is the revenue that we have been able to generate in a very short amount of time. So since August 2017 to January 5th, 2018, the department generated 208 million in market value gain. You know, so just by adding Cyclomedia to our workflows to identify and rectify the property characteristics, we have been able to uh, not only improve our data, our models, and subsequently uh, the revenue that we're generating for the city of New York. So let me show you um, Cyclomedia in action. They have two applications, and this is the latest that it's a um, little bit. I prefer this one. Amanda, the, the 200 million uh, was gotten from what percentage of all the parcels? I can't recall that figure. But General, I like 20%, 50%? I think it was. Probably 20, but I'm, I'm just guessing. So potentially, mm -hmm. you can yeah, multiply we, that by What that. we think is that, um, well, we need to continue to improve our data. And we know there are issues with it. And that's going to take a long time, because we have a large repository. And we have limited resources. So I think if you can pretty much multiply that by six years and assume that we're just going to continue to generate already 208 and a little bit more than that as, as we move forward. Eventually, it will level off as we um, you know, improve our data. But once it's revenue that we have gained, we will continue to gain that 208. I'd just like to note that, I mean, here we have an example of GIS being responsible, just in this instant, <clears throat> with somewhere between a 200 million to a billion dollar potential revenue gain every single year out into the future. I mean... Well, this is half a year. Maybe. Maybe, maybe. Oh, well, 200 million in hand, basically. It's the dollars like, could go down. Yes, but, yes, but I, I think the scale is awesome and it's attributable to GIS. So if anyone says, oh, what is GIS and pretty map? No, it's a revenue generator on this scale, which is sort of and, astonishing. And are we talking about the value that is assessed value or is the revenue gains actually attributable to the it, It's assessed value. That's what we collect. Okay. Yeah. So just, which is a lot lower than market value. You know, I, I think this, these are interesting questions because people always tend to think that property value is very high in, in, in property assessment. It's higher in New York City than other municipalities, but it's not the case. Actually, one, two, three, tax class one, it's not as high as you would find it across the river in New Jersey. So, and there are other examples out throughout the country that taxing a lot more than the city of New York. 
So it's just complicated to uh, understand. And even the seasoned staff, you know, we have a hard time sometimes communicating this to the public because of the models and the uh, different um, calculations that are applied depending on the type of property that you have. So there's tax class one, two, then there's the retail, and everything uses a slightly different uh, calculation and model to assess the value. Can I just ask you, so when you're going through this process, you just, and the, at the end you're changing the assessment uh, on the property owner and you notify them, we've changed it because yeah. of A, B, X, and Y, and are they generally accepting or are there a lot of challenging going on? Well, that, that's always there. Yes, we have a separate team that addresses those uh, when people challenge the, the assessment of the property. Mm -hmm. And it even goes a step further. If they don't feel we're trying to help them, they go to the tax commission and try to uh, negotiate the, a decrease on their uh, property assessment. You know, uh, there are times that, there are instances that we can't control it. Uh, a property is sold and it, the transaction wasn't done correctly and there's the wrong name and they forgot to pay back of taxes and, and then over time they, you know, just accumulated more and by the time the other person gets the property, there are 10 million there and they feel it's unfair because they were not responsible uh, for all of those previous transactions. But we always try to work with the public. Uh, we have the Office of the Advocate that is also part of the Department of Finance. It's been in place for the past, uh, I would say, three, four years. And uh, so we hear you out. If you have concerns regarding your assessment, we'll take a look revise our records, and try to be fair uh, with uh, our clients. So here's Cycle Media. It has the actual 2D map and then the images to the right. You can pan around, as I mentioned before. Those dots are the cycloramas, and those are the points where the actual photos were snapped. So you can actually manipulate it by entering an address and then um, selecting the particular uh, cyclorama to zoom in at a better angle so you can actually do uh, measurements. So you can actually here, zoom in. Bear with me. to uh, this distance, take a measurement of the facade, just the width of one of these buildings. So you just go to one of the tools, you pick what you like, and then you start measuring. I don't know if with this I'm going to be able to do it. I'm trying to put a point. It's not straight, but it will give you the distance, but what I want to show you is this. This is the data behind those images. So it's not just photos like Google Maps. There is intelligence. There is X and Y and Z values. And this is what our new team is going to be uh, exploring. How can we use all this data that we're getting as a you know, byproduct of the images <coughs> of cyclomedia. Um, there's a lot of distortion, a lot of noise. You can see, you know, there are cars if you only want to 
capture this structure, you know, it's kind of, you need to clean a lot. Um, but there are limitations. You know, it, we say that in terms of um, Z values, you can only get up to six stories high, which is a problem because we have taller buildings. So, for example, if we wanted to capture all the windows to then do uh, line of sight analysis, it would be limited to buildings that are below six stories high. Um, but it's very cool technology. Um, our assessors have been very receptive and they're very happy using this new tool. And I, that's something that is very important, and especially for us in city government, to push uh, the use of new technology and to just expose your own staff to better ways to do, the, to do their day-to-day -day work. Um, sometimes people get, you know, oh, well, I'm used to do it this way, you know. Just got to push people a little bit so they can not only learn, but be exposed to better tools to do their uh, work. So let me just pan around. Let's see if I can do it. So, so Amanda, this is both photography backed by the positional accuracy of the LIDAR. Yes. And that's why the measurements are accurate, because there are actual coordinates behind it. Can you give you any estimate of the accuracy of those measurements? Uh, I don't have that information with me. Um, but your inspectors are feeling it's trustworthy. Yes, and yes. That's, that's yeah. Tough. yeah, because we already have some building characteristics, property characteristics, mm -hmm. so you can sort of you know, make an educated decision that perhaps the size is it's more accurate using these tools. Because there's no way for um, an assessor to actually go and measure the actual building or try to measure, you know, in, in the vertical part. So at least with this, we can assign a value that might be slightly approximate, but it's pretty accurate. Is, is the picture you're showing now an example of how it's very dense at street level and as you get up six? Exactly. Okay. That's what I wanted to show in terms of how you lose some of the uh, granularity as you move uh, vertically uh, upwards. Amanda, can you supplement this with oblique angle photography? That's yes. Down. Yes. Yes. Uh, that's our intent. And we do use uh, pictometry. You know, our assessors use a combination of this, pictometry, orthophotos, anything that we can find. Especially the obliques are necessary because we can't see behind the building. The vehicle can only get the front. This is something that um, we learn more about it with um, the Parks Department, that they wanted to use some cyclomedia, but they only drive regular streets, not city park streets. So they couldn't capture um, the assets of the parks department. What so, about do its planimetrics? Hmm? What about do its planimetrics? Yes. The planimetrics, actually, the building footprints are already part of our DTM online application. So they're visible. And that's another application that the assessors use if they want to look at the size of the lot because that's one of the characteristics that they also have to take into account. They use all the tools that I, uh, you know, demonstrated before. What is important about Cyclomedia, we wanted it, and we said, we don't care, we're gonna pay how many millions it is. It wasn't as expensive as we thought. We got a good contract, we have it for six years. We're doing two captures a year, and any other city agency can use it for free anybody and we have been encouraging all city agencies to do so the department of transportation intends to use it um i believe for sidewalk management and pedestrian ramps I'm no ready, i'm already using it all right all good right. to hear <laughs> um sorry. yeah do it um health uh, parks i mean 
It's free to all city agencies, and that is very important. I have a couple of questions. First of all, the uh, LIDAR, was this from the citywide fly or special that you guys did? This is just for from Cyclomedia uh, data. The other thing is, is many years ago when we started developing the base map, mm -hmm. there were always issues about the finance map and the city planning map because if you really put it together, the block and lots in the regular city map would not be very uh, useful for people who own property because they're, you know, it was built slowly and, the, you know, the yeah. measurements were not accurate. So what, what has been done now? Is there any rectification? How, did, how would this work, for example, if we go forward with an infrastructure thing, okay, we ultimately would like to see the underground attached over, but it would probably be working on the base map. What would happen with property? Well, with, like in this? regards to the tax map, uh, over time we have rectified some of the issues, and you know, let's say there's always a uh, distortion. So uh, we know that there are issues. Uh, there are instances that we can rectify them, but it becomes a domino effect. If you're trying to modify one parcel, you're modifying the entire block. And that is very dangerous because um, if I'm fixing the lot of client A, but client B doesn't know that, and I change the line slightly, it's a legal battle. Right. So at this, we have a disclaimer that specifically states that there is some distortion. But ultimately, what you look at is at the deep. And that has all the meets and bounds right. description. Right. So we always say to the to to the clients, our our uh, public, it is a way for you to visualize the parcel. Right. But you always go back to the deed, and that is the record with all the meets and bounds, and that's what holds in in the court of law, not our map. To your question, yes, two different agencies create a layer and they don't fully align. We're aware, and some people get confused and say to us that our house is in between the boundary of a, of a parcel. We're aware, do it created the, the uh, building of footprints. We deal with the tax map. So we're hoping that in the new generation of the uh, tax map, we have the tools to then rectify those particular areas. And it's not throughout the whole city. It tends to be mostly in Staten Island because they're newer in terms of uh, development. So, um, but again, yeah, we, we're aware of the issues in terms of uh, rectifying certain boundary parcels, but uh, in the future, that's something that we definitely want to have as a day-to-day day operation in our shop. And New York City is, is so good at establishing standards for the rest of our nation. I wonder, since you are you know, borrowing technology from Philadelphia, if you are collaborating with other cities on these standards that, you know, that are very Well, I, uh, to certain, well, Cyclomedia is different. Uh, as for 3D, I have nobody to talk to. Um, I was talking earlier with uh, George, and I had the opportunity to meet a professor from the University of Strasbourg, uh, Germany, a couple of weeks ago, and I felt so good. <laughs> it was great. Uh, so I have to go outside of the US to have these type of uh, collaborations and conversations. But I'm proud that we're doing it, and it is New York City that is doing it. You know, I always feel that we, we have all the good ideas and then we just don't act on them. So, you know, this is a, a very exciting opportunity in many ways. And uh, I think, you know, we have leadership that is supporting us and that is, you know, quite unique. So, um, yeah, that's, that's, I'm alone. <laughs> no, I have a great staff. They always listen to me. <laughs> Um, as it relates to 
do its underground work and to DOT work in, in terms of capturing street furniture and mm -hmm. manholes. I, I mean, does, does the cyclomedia do the job of being able to identify manholes? Yes, you can. Um, the contract that we established doesn't cover that. That's something that each agency would need to um, engage cyclomedia <coughs> to, in, to, a, to do extraction. In our particular um, use case, we want to do it ourselves. That's why we have this uh, LIDAR team, because we have to assess property. The frequency is too great for us to hire somebody to do it for us. In the case of the DOT, let's say sidewalk um, pet ramps. Once you get the full inventory, then you just add to it. For us, it's like it's constantly changing. So we rather have our team, but you can contract those services from Cyclomedia. And I think I've learned already there are uh, other vendors that are providing these kind of services. I believe one is in Brooklyn. I forgot the name. Um, but I just want the algorithms that everybody creates so that it's easier for our staff. I'll say that you're not alone in the 3D world. Yeah, well, in, in the sense of um, cadastral, yes, but not in general 3D. The, uh, you know, the city of New York already has the city GML for uh, buildings, which I integrated in my app. And it's pretty cool to overlay that, because then you can see some of the, uh, let me see if I can look at it. You can then see if the actual air lot is floating above. Okay. Type in. probably take a little bit to render. Uh, but do it has been ahead of the curve in 3D. I mean, they published this, how, how long has it been? Two years ago? That was, it was before I started, but yeah. I yeah. Think it's based on so, you know, we're, the different city agencies, we're catching up. So we're, we're you know, trying to help each other out and adopt the, the, you know, the latest technology that is out there. I mean, what groups about? like this is what makes that collaboration happen. What about integrating your Cyclomedia 3D point scans into that model that DOIT has? Because it's airborne LiDAR, and so at the ground level, curve level, it's, it's not as good. We know some people that have constructed curve level heights in that model, mm -hmm. uh, but are lacking for data. Oh. And the Cyclomedia data could do that, because that curve level heights needed for, like, automated vehicles and other things like that, that would be a great connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Who's involved? With this yeah. Stuff? I'll, I'll put you in contact with the, the team that's working on that. But, but you're using CDGML, which is an OGC standard, right? Uh, well, do it. Implementation. Do it created the, the building. Yeah, uh, it's right. yeah, CDGML. Yes. Yeah, I should note, we're actually trying to see if we can create an update Version of the city general buildings with the current IR. Mm -hmm. um, so that would, I think, be a higher level of detail than what we yes. have. Yes. Yeah. And of course, you know, anything that anybody else produces, then we'll consume uh, for our own applications. Um, what are the data sets like we need to get to there in LAS format? The yes. SPRS LAS yeah. format? Yeah. 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 Which is what you're integrating with the airport mm -hmm. LIDAR anyway. Yeah. So. Do they provide classified or is it all unclassified? Oh. No, <laughs> it's not classified. That's what the team is working on. Okay. And it's been uh, a labor of love. 
Um, I think when I briefly talked to you at uh, Jim McConnell's uh, farewell party, um, there are always all these different issues, you know, there's how do you manipulate the data, but one of the biggest issues is where do we put all this data? I mean, we're talking about lots, lots of data, and in our particular use case, capture twice a year, I mean, by the time we analyze one, we're getting a new one, and this continues to grow. So these are the conversations that we're, you know, we're starting to have with uh, our IT department, our uh, do it department, and trying to see how can we store, manipulate, share all this information within our um, you know, city agencies. So uh, that's something that one always has to uh, take into account. You know, where are these things going to live? and what kind of tools then we can generate so not only the specialized staff can use them but anybody who has some sort of application for them. Are you projecting models like we had a hurricane Sandy a couple years ago, assessment was incredibly complicated, rockways and things, so, so are, you, are you running models in your department that would prevent future complications like that? Well, we have uh, in our contract specifications that in case of a natural disaster or uh, any particular emergency, which we tend to get often, uh, a capture of cyclomedia will be taken. And we will have that fresh data that then we can zoom in and target those specific areas that have been affected by uh, an emergency <coughs> or a natural disaster. So we're planning ahead. I know that Gizmo has been very active in that. <clears throat> yeah, I, again, organizations like this is what brings the community together, and in case of emergency, we respond, right, Al? Yeah, yeah, we all <laughs> and, and it's OEM that, that really does coordinate yes. and has played a major role in, in disasters. Uh, are, you, are you finished? Are you Sure. Okay, because I, I wrote on a number of things that relate to what you you have been doing and relate to what I did. Because I joined the Department of Finance in 1982 when this whole computerization of Ancama began. And some observations that are true not only in finance, but in other agencies which in the 80s began computerizing things. One of them was, oh, suddenly a mass input of technology and a lowering of interest in data. And if you know me here in Israel, I'm always talking about data, data, data. We can have all the technology we want, all this fancy stuff, but if the data is no good, input no good, output no good. And one of the things that happened in finance is that we kind of rushed into buying PCs and a lot of training and a lot of modeling and a lot of all this kind of stuff and we stopped collecting data. And our data really sunk. I think it's come back a little bit, but there, were a, there was a period of time, about five or 10 years, when nobody updated anything. And our data really terrible. And I think that kind of thing was happening in other agencies as well. So that's one thing. I saw your presentation. I organized something, for those of you who don't remember this or didn't go, I organized something at the Queen's Museum a year ago to introduce um, GIS to the public. And one of the presentations was Amanda and Dave. Oh, come on. Michelle. Dave. Dave Lachelle? Yes. From S3. Dave Lachelle from Esri taught me about this three dimensional stuff. But this is already more than, more than a year ago. Mm -hmm. And you were just starting to use it. And I think just a wonderful application. But if you know the story, there are so many legal things that have to do with our property tax. So many of our properties, particularly if they're not in the heart of Manhattan, have a tax abatement for 20 years. So no matter how much you can improve the valuation of these condo lots that are way high in the sky, and these, oh, the, these properties are worth a million dollars. I mean, in 432 Park Avenue, they've got 
80 million dollar apartments, they don't pay any property tax because they've got abatements for 20 years. So they're not collecting that possibility. Whereas at the same time, these new buildings are casting shadows on other buildings and really decreasing the value right away of buildings that are nearby. An example, I live in Flushing, right around, mostly in a six-story apartment house neighborhood. A new con, right around the corner from me, a 14-story condo went up on a relatively narrow street for three, it's across the street from a six-story apartment building, not mine, next door to mine, for three months a year, in the, in the low sun period from November to January, the people across the street from the condo see no sun. The street trees see no sun. The rich people are stealing sunshine from the poor people in that building and, the, and, the, and from the trees, and they're not getting property, they're not getting taxed. Whereas if those people were smart, they should be filing for, hey, we're, we're not worth as much now because this building is shadowing us. Exactly, and these are the issues of equity that yes. we have now taken into account. That's why we're moving with 3D, because we want to be able to do a fair assessment. And these are the realities. People yeah. are Now we have the capability of doing that. And for those of you, I get, I don't know if anybody else here gets mailings from city council directly from Corey Johnson, who is now the head of city council. And city council laid out, I think, four priorities for the, for the coming four years. And one of them is property tax equity, and another one is lead in the environment. And so, uh, so ironically, I spent my career as a geographer so much in property tax assessment, and my best friend when I entered graduate school uh, in 1967 in geography became an expert on the environment. So, I mean, we're tackling some big priorities. Here. Yeah, I, I mean... It, uh, we are way behind in, in, in fair assessments. And uh, as you know, the market is, is very strong. You know, I feel it every day in my office, the amount of applications that we get, uh, not only for subdividing the land, but the creation of condominiums, is, it's just nonstop. I mean, it doesn't take much. When you step outside, and what do you see? Cranes. I mean, I live in the borough of Queens from my street on Northern Boulevard. I could see Manhattan. Now I see Long Island City. You know, this is just, just kidding. No, on the roof of my building in Flushing, we used to have a, a total view of the skylight. Now you have to go here and there and there to see between the new buildings that have popped up. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very aggressive. So, uh, Anyway, and thank you for a very clear presentation. Thank and, you. And then the kind of took off after, and took over after I left. And I introduced GIS to my Well, dad. yeah, that, that is a very good story to share. When, when Jack created uh, Gizmo, he was at finance, and I remember being in this room, and he would talk about back then we used map info. Yes, we did. And then we moved to Esri products, but we also, you know, Kenny knows getting back back there. Um, we also even used Maptitude. I mean, it's like we were trying all the just different tools. Uh, eventually, um, S-Ray took over the market, and um, that's what we use. So it's very interesting that meeting him then and where I'm, where I'm at at this moment in my uh, professional career, it's, it's very interesting. So it's kind of like we've been holding hands all this, you know, these past 20 years. So it's been a, a great pleasure. Yes, <laughs> mine and me too. So any additional questions? Hey, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, some other city agencies um, might be in touch with uh, Cypher Media in order to ask them to identify features of the yes. images. So I wonder if you um, can share a little bit the methodology or how are they tagging or labeling those images? Um, asking because um, I think, I believe there are many also uh, research groups that would love to just do that. I don't know if that, that costs money to do that, but to do some computer vision analysis. <coughs> yeah, I, I don't know how they go about, you know, delivering that those specific products. I don't know. My understanding is that they have a subcontract. 
uh, but I don't know who. Most of the work, this is a product from the Netherlands. A lot of the intelligence involved in all of these uh, technologies comes from there, and we're not privy to, to all of that information. Left out one thing, and I'm so pleased to hear that you have a good relationship with the assessors, and the assessors you know, use your tools or whatever. It's something that, when I first started working at finance, we did not have. The, the assessors were afraid of us computerizing everything because there was a core group of the best assessors in the High Valley of Manhattan property areas who were corrupt. And they were afraid that a computerized system would find them out, which it did. And one of the things that found them out during the 2001 disaster, it, a phone call was intercepted from the World Trade Center, where one of our high-valued assessors, who was also a member of the, or the delegate to the union of all things, an inter, a phone call was intercepted between him and the World Trade Center and one of his clients saying he would meet him outside. And they intercepted that phone call, and that broke the ring of the assessors, and most of those assessors were fired, and uh, in, in, in the years that followed, we had that much better cooperation. And that's, Do you um, that? that it, it has been one of our initiatives to bring the two together. I mean, uh, specifically, you know, the tax map unit is now integrated with the property division, so that in itself has improved the communication with these two different teams, as well as with the modelers and the uh, data analytics group. But this is for you, Jack. This is the tentative role published <coughs> for the first time as a <coughs> map uh, journal. So now you can read all the findings. It's published in our website. And it has maps. Look at this, Jack. <laughs> Look. Queens, it's all there. So this used to be published for a long time in some, you know, PDF. That was the, you know, latest. Uh, but it was a cumbersome kind of like publication. Now it's interactive, and all of the the data in terms of our tentative assessment role is available via a story map. To this point, I've seen old maps called like the red maps or something like that. I'll look in the past, like the banks <coughs> assess property. And if you were like a Brooklyn resident, you couldn't get a loan to put a boiler in your, your, your building because the value of the lane wasn't assessed high enough to get a loan. Do you know what I mean? That was the banks in the past. So yeah. This is all wonderful. So, uh, this is I, our latest product. Um, in terms of GIS tools that we have been able to uh, implement in the past uh, four years. I, I just want to get back to the question you asked about the availability of the cyclomedia data by nonprofit groups, groups outside of city government to do an assessment uh, of their own. Uh, and the subject of city data being made available to the public is one that's out there very much so. So uh, it's probably a question that needs to be answered. So if you'd write to me, get my email from Gizmo website, whatever. Well, I can say or, that it's a contractual issue. We, we just, it only stays within the city government. We, in order for us to let someone have access to it, we will need to sit with our you know, uh, legal team and determine if that's feasible. So basically, you will need to buy your own. It, it, it may be that Cyclone Media would be happy to contract for additional money to pull specific to, features exactly. out with the city's OK. Exactly. So we should, I mean, there are probably a lot of groups that may have that yeah. interest. So if you just write to me about it, we can make some inquiries and you know, work with Amanda and whatever mm -hmm. and see what can be done. Yeah. I'd like to add, from the private sector, I know we do a lot of our own laser scanning, surveying, is an effort to reduce costs of field work and also for safety concern. The less hours people are out in the field under these streets, the safer everybody is. So that's that's the primary concern, but also if we're doing projects for a city agency, 
the data already exists, maybe it's cheaper for us to buy at a discount the existing data from Cycle Media rather than having the agency pay to have it collected a second time. Thanks. Um, so I, we, we've also made the push to adopt Pro. Um, and um, I also, I mean, I'm the head of the group, so even our own staff can be pushed a little bit because, like you said, when you're comfortable with something that's such a mature product, it's hard. But um, I totally agree that it's, once you get over that sort of hump, it, it's, it's a great product and it, it just runs faster and smoother. And, um, yeah, and, and you have both worlds. It, it coexists with 2D, so you have 2D, 3D, you can toggle between the two. Yeah. And um, it's for those who have been using uh, ESRI products for a long time, probably when you start using Pro, you remember ArcView 3. You know, there's certain elements that they brought back from the older suite back into, you know, 2018. So it's very interesting. You know, I, I always recommend um, my staff and um, other GIS professionals to, you know, focus on, on the, I'm a geographer, on the theory and geography, understanding maps. And these are great tools. And, you know, it's a sort of like using Word, but if you don't know how to write, it's not going to do it right for you. So if these are tools and everybody can learn them, but you can use them correctly when you have the right background to apply it. So, uh, you know, it's the, uh, for us geographers, it's kind of like, you know, when people ask you to make a pretty map, mm -hmm. and they say, can you make it orange and yellow <laughs> and put some pink, and you just go back to your office very angry, trying to suppress all those emotions, and you're like, there are cartographic standards. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it's something that, uh, utilizing pro it's it's there but you know having a background in uh, in the field uh, allows you to make a correct map but I was gonna ask because it's so nice how it's also integrated with the online uh -huh. platform and you know has there been have you given any thought to using the apps like collector like the data collection apps especially I would think the assessors going out because that also is sort of nicely integrated Yes, we have been um, toying with the additional products of the suite to see if that's something we can implement. Um, but we also have been looking at other products uh, that can easily integrate already with the Kama system. Because our Kama system is also reaching its uh, end. We need to start thinking about what else are we going to do. Of course, you know. My recommendation is that it starts with the map and then you go from there. Um, so maybe we will see a different uh, generation of what a camera system looks like. And there are certain technical difficulties integrating that software with Collector. But yes, we have thought about you know extracting some of the data, then taking it to the field, rectifying it, and then bring, bring it back and load it back to the uh, repository. I have used uh, a little bit of collector and just created little samples, but not extensively. But the beauty is that you can just build up an application very quickly on your desktop in a matter of minutes, deploy it to your cell phone, and off you go. And, you know, yeah, the tools are better than 20 years ago. <laughs> sure. <Excuse me. clears throat> Is your team or the assessors looking for encroachments on the public right away when they do their assessment? Mm, they find them. Okay. Uh, for and example, <laughs> there is a triangle uh, in the middle of this complicated intersection. And there's a dealership across the street that decided that they were going to fence it and put vehicles there for sale. So in examples like that that are very obvious, we take note and try to determine who is the owner of that property. And sometimes it is city property. So it, that's very easy to uh, resolve. I'm, I'm more interested in like um, somebody 
put a fence up that is beyond their property line. You guys obviously know where the property lines are because that's where you're going to assess the land value and the <coughs> building value. Is any of that being documented? Uh, the owner of the property would need to come to us for us to take uh, further action. So you're not? No. Yeah. There are very specific cases that we might. Uh, <clears throat> so, certain examples of remainders of streets, I think Queens come to mind, where people have actually fenced it. And then they requested that we merge this property into his property. And then we reach out to legal to find the status of this particular street. And more than enough times we reject it. But there is no enforcement that would go after him for doing such a thing. Yeah. I mean, the DOT also deals with a well, lot of those issues in terms of encroachments. The being getting a lot better. In the, yeah. in the past, they, didn't, they just looked at plans and were only concerned about what was actually being built mm -hmm. on the lot. Even though the drawings show that they were going to uh, erect illegal steps on the public right of way, now they're better. They have to. They make sure that anything that is in the drawing that's beyond the actual real property layer comes to DOT, and either they have to remove it, amend their design, something like that. Mm -hmm. But just being there at DOT for the last two and a half years, when I walk down the street, everything's illegal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I know. I know. Oh, yeah. Especially when it's <laughs> This, yeah, especially with the sidewalks. Yeah, somebody wants to have a nice garden, so they it just put the fence. This is maybe slightly off the topic, but it's important as well. I'm teaching a course on the geography of New York City, this is adult education, and we were talking about zoning, and somebody asked me a question that I could not answer, but I think there is a good answer. Is there a way to look up zoning changes historically for parcels? Um, that would be a matter of, you know, I don't, I can't speak for another agency that's under the jurisdiction of the Department of uh, City Planning. That's city planning. Yeah. yeah. So um, <clears throat> they have been better about uh, making that information accessible, but I don't know if they have previous um, years. I mean, you can uh, look up zoning, that's not a problem. <clears throat> Suppose you want to find out what the zoning was 10 years ago. Yeah. Anybody know? Well, yeah. Well, you can do it. We have we built data sets that track years of zoning. You saved those layers. Yes. By getting them from city planning. Yes. So, but you saved them yourself. Yes. In other words, we'd have to somehow either ask you or but it's, it can be done if you, can it be done from scratch? Um, yes. I mean, it takes data. It's data, data driven that creates our 3D zoning walls. I mean, it, sometimes that's very important to understand why an area is booming now. Yes, it is. Any other questions? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you.